So hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar. In this presentation you'll learn about the reasons why hoist chain lubrication is so important. We'll be discussing the most common concerns, myths, and misconceptions our team has encountered from crane technicians. Presenting today will be Peter Cook, our training manager covering rigging and hoist and load securement. Also joining us today is Peter Hogan, our quality manager from our Lexington chain operations. My name is Gisela Clark. I'm the e-marketing specialist at Columbus McKinnon and will be your host for today's webinar. We will be recording the session today and the recording link will be added to our YouTube channel. All in attendance will receive a link to the recording. So everyone is in listen-only mode and we encourage you to ask questions in our Q&A pane as you've so nicely done now. On the right side of your page, we'll take five minutes at the end to address your questions. Thank you for your attention and now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Peter so that we can begin. Peter? Thank you, Lisa, and good morning, everybody. Um, like you so said, today's hoist chain lubrication, why is it so important? And we'll go over the types of CM chain used in our hoist, uh, the embossing, cleaning, lubrication, and some case studies to show you what happens uh, when there is lack of lubrication or lack of a cleaning schedule. And uh, I feel it's one of the most important maintenance items you can do for your hoist, but probably the most overlooked one or one that's not done enough. And so, uh, for whatever reason, not a lot of people maintain a lubrication schedule with their hoisting equipment. And as always, as we have these webinars, you know, we always have disclaimers. You are, you are to uh, read your, you know, this isn't a substitute for ASME standards or OSHA or the service guides that manufacturers provide. So um, just want to be sure that you reference that information. Um, and this is just for informational purposes only. So let's talk about, start off and talk about the CM hoist chain. CM designs special grade chain for their hoists and we do not recommend that you substitute anyone else's chain for the, for the hoist. We need that dimensional stability. We calibrate the chain so it fits perfectly within our hoist and if you just deviate slightly from the pitch diameters, things of that nature, um, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have wear issues, jamming issues. So Whenever you're replacing the chain, stick with the original manufacturer of that equipment. Uh, and I always like to make note that hoist chain is very different from rigging chains. Uh, we don't rig with hoist chain. Uh, if we're going to do any type of rigging, we stick with the alloy chains, and those are grades 63, 80, and 100. Primarily grades 80 and 100 are what's used out there today. So let's start off, and we're going to focus more on the star grade chain today, but CM manufactures what's called star grade chain. It's specifically designed for CM hoist. They've been uh, making star grade um, since they became a hoist company in the early turn of the century. Um, it provides for maximum wear resistance. It's high strength. And what we do special on the star grade chain is we put a case harness on it. And that case depth is 10,000 or 15,000 of, of an inch. And we need that case depth for wear resistance. Um, it's running at high speeds. And so it'll, it'll prevent wear. Of course, if you don't lubricate it, it'll wear into that case depth. And so once we get through that case depth, uh, then we're going to have the, the wear is going to accelerate even more. And so we'll, we'll talk about that more as it goes on. But star grade is the chain that we use in our powered hoist. So whether that be electric or air powered because of the fast speeds. As compared to manual hoist, something that you see with lever, lever tools and chain falls, we would use a disc grade hoist and we represent that with a dot on the chain. As you can see there, an actual chain link with that dot. Um, and it's it's a through hardened chain, okay. But we would never want to use this chain for powered hoist because you would have extreme wear issues. So again, we only use that in our manual powered hoist, low speed um, manual hoist and lever tools because they run at low speeds. So those are the two main chains. And then in special applications, we will use stainless steel chain. Uh, we need to be in a clean environment, corrosive resistance, suitable for washdowns. And so we'll recommend a stainless steel chain. However, it's not as strong as the star grade chain, and it doesn't have the excellent wear properties such as star grade chain does. But it is a definitely a better chain in those environments. Uh, one thing we do want to make note that you do not substitute stainless steel into a hoist that was designed to use with star grade. Now, there are special things we need to do to that hoist. So you need to contact uh, the manufacturer anytime you're going to substitute or change your hoist over to stainless steel. Um, that was using normal chain before. So just don't um, put stainless steel chain in there. 
Okay. And then you see the bossing there, SSTL, and it signifies stainless steel chain. Versus our overseas market, we have an EN818 rated chain, and we signify that with DT, DAT, or T. And you can see there's the embossing on there. Uh, the, the DAT or DT are the same inspection criteria as star grade, so they're equivalent to our star grade chain. Uh, it's just more for international markets. And for uh, some manual products, we use a T embossing, which would be similar to the disc grade chain. And then we have a German quality stamp. So again, I'm just doing things that you'll find on some of our chains. It's an H22 mark, and that is where our chain has gone through testing, and we gotten that certification to have that stamp on there and that show about every uh, 10 links and that's a, quali a, a quality stamp that, that we adhere to and that we design to and that we um, get a third party audit to, to achieve that H22 stamp that we get and that signifies a Columbus McKinnon. H22 is us, Columbus McKinnon and if you were to submit you may be an H whatever 30 or something of that nature if you were to do that so everyone Every manufacturer gets their own H stamp when they apply for that quality procedure. <clears throat> Some other embossings that we did uh, up until 2004, you can see there's our star grade chain. And we put year of manufacture, in this case this example shows an, an X minus, which was manufactured in the year 2001. And then we would have a trace code on there. And we, that's how we embossed our chain up until the year 2004. Um, so today, we just went over these types of chains here. They, the maximum frequency, they happen every 10 links. So you can see the star, disc, and stainless steel. Uh, but other things you're going to find is you're going to find the three-letter trace code. Okay? You're going to find the manufacturer's ID. Okay? In our case, it's CMUSA. We have employee ID number, so it's the clock number of that employee who was manu running the machines that were manufacturing the, ch the chain on that uh, given run. And then we also start incorporated a Julian date code. So in this case, in this the picture that we took here of this chain was 273, which is the 273rd day of the year or September 30th. So we know exactly who made it, what day it was made, um, the year. So that's we, a lot of quality goes behind that. So it's it's very traceable, you know, with high quality um, inspections, things of that nature. So. Um, we can get it right down to the exact heat number of the steel that it came from. So there's a lot of information that we can obtain from our chain um, just by those embossings. So that's what everything means on this thing. Everything that we use for overhead lifting has embossings on there for identification purposes and that you know that it's a quality chain that you're putting into your hoisting equipment. All right, so let's talk about lubrication and cleaning. One of the things, you know, people get a new hoist and uh, feel they can take the hoist right out of the box, hook it up, and you're ready to go, and there's nothing really that needs to be done at that point. And there's a lot that needs to be done when you when you purchase a new hoist. There's a lot of things you need to verify. You need to verify, was it damaged in shipping? Um, is there any loose parts, cracked parts, things from shipping that happen on there? You want to verify power, re power requirements, hookup points, things that it's all matching, um, that it's, you know, safe to put up. And the one thing that's often overlooked is chain lubrication. Now, we do lubricate our chain at the factory, but we don't put an awful lot of lubricant on it. So depending on if you have a box good or a box chain hoist, how long that was sitting on the shelf, um, you know, oil has viscosity. And, and so it may not be there when you get the hoist, or it might be very little, or it might be a little on the dry side. Now, we could heavily lubricate that chain and send it to you. The problem being is that you'll see some boxes come through that, you know, will have oil for the chain and actually, you know, because it is viscous, it will find its way out of the box and thus it'll have a stained oil box and then people think there's something wrong with the hoist, that the hoist uh, gear box is leaking and it's really due to the chain. So we have to have enough lubrication on there so that the hoist, the chain is lubricated, but too much, you know, will cause some quality issues where the perception is that you have a leaking hoist, so that's not a good thing either. So. Um, it's always advisable, and we tell people that when you place your hoist in service, to lubricate your chain before operation, okay? Um, what, you, what we see happening in the QC department is all of a sudden they'll hear noises coming from it. There'll be a new hoist, and they'll be one or two months in service or even less, and they start hearing some noises uh, of the chain, and at that point it's too late. They're probably wearing the chain and getting into that case step. And so here you have, it's a shame you have this new hoist that you're running with dry chain and it wasn't installed properly. So that's part of the um, pre-operational um, 
checklist that when you're installing a hoist that you should go through and make sure that chain is lubricated. So what type of lubrication normally do we do we recommend for, for normal operation? Well, we put a lubricate bar and chain oil 10R on there, and we feel that's the most effective lubrication for our hoist chain. Um, where it can occur if you're using other than what we recommend. Now, now something's always better than nothing, and there's some people that like graphite or, or a light spray on um, because they don't want um, things to cling to the chain from oil, things of that. And there, there's various reasons why some people do not want to use the bar and chain oil, but may be advised that that's what we recommend. Um, and if you use something different, you would run into wear issues, and you would want to inspect that chain. Um, probably on a monthly basis to be sure you're not wearing out the paint if you're substituting other than the lubrication that we recommend um, until you get some good uh, inspection history that that lubricant was okay to use. The main thing when you're when you're looking at the lubricant, you, you, what we use is what, what's uh, effective is this EP additive extreme pressure. So without the additive, you will not be able to keep your lubrication between links while under full load. So it just kind of you know migrates away from those inner links thus causing the wear. Sometimes we get asked the question, well, what about in food environments? What type of lubrication do we use? And so we have, we recommend what's called a Luberplate FP150. Um, it's viscous, uh, viscosity at SA, SA70. It's waterproof, res, uh, resisting heavy water washdowns. Um, I know I was at Kraft Foods and a craft food plant where they started using this and the maintenance uh, crews liked it a lot. It was kind of like a honey type of texture to it is what they said and it held up well in washdowns and they were using nothing um, for lubrication because worried about contaminating food and thus they were having uh, some issues with the chain jumping around and wearing and uh, causing damage to the hoist. So again, they, you know, something is better than nothing and then so there's the, there's the lubricant that Columbus McKinnon will recommend for food grade environments. So how do you know when your hoist needs to be lubricated? So your hoist is in service, and so you know often we get asked the question, well, how do you know? When? How often do we lubricate? And it all depends on the, you know it's hard to give a a blanket answer for that. So you're you're just gonna your operators really need to keep an eye on that and during their pre-operational inspections. Um, but it's gonna feel dry. There'll be not much oil in your hand if you wipe it. There's really not much there. It's you know your hand is really not that oily. It's just, you might be a little dirty just from because any type of steel that you touch you're going to get some a little bit of grease or oil buildup but it's not a real you should see you should have some lubrication in your hand when you wipe it um, also on the chain bag now operators may not be able to see this but it could stack up on the side of the chain bag because it's not articulating so uh, when the chain is dry and it stacks up it eventually comes out over the top of the chain bucket because it's just not articulating um, there's not a lot of oil on it and it could spill out on the operator so if the chain is properly lubricated, it'll float evenly and disperse into the bag like water. Um, so another good reason to lubricate your chain is you don't want that chain to spill out of the bag, and it's not going to feel too good to your operator with that chain if the chain does spill out and come down. And so it is it is a safety hazard um, by not lubricating properly. Um, the other thing is you hear a creaking sound as the chain is running over the lift wheel. If you're hearing that creaking sound, you know again it's it's definitely most likely time to replace that chain. It's, it's just too late to, to salvage that chain. So what you're actually hearing is a chain wearing itself out by friction, uh, welding the links together and breaking that weld because there's no lube between them. And so it's, it, it's getting extremely hot at that point. And the hot is the heat. We can't really get a good temperature of how to measure, but it's, it's almost like rub your hands together, dry, and as hard and as fast as you can. You won't be able to do that for long because it'll burn. So just do, you think about that, the pressure that you can just apply manually, you know, skin on skin, it's extremely hot. Now, can you imagine thousands of pounds of pressure going over lift wheel at, hot, at fast speeds? What heat that must generate? Um, another good example is you ever take a long wood screw and screw it into a, a piece of wood and then unscrew it and, and touch it, it'll burn you. It's extremely hot. And that's just from that short period of time that you're drilling into that wood. So um, you can imagine how hot chain would get running dry over the lift wheel, thus causing the chain, to, uh, it could even become, the case could even become softer and even wear even quicker. So oil uh, lubrication is important. The other thing you, um, you also want to do is have a maintenance cleaning schedule. 
Um, you could use solvents on there. Uh, you would want to use a stout or dist uh, distilled, excuse me, distillation petroleum solvent or mineral spirits, but you do not want to use acidic um, solvents on there. Acidic could destroy the chain. It could damage the chain. So we stay away from acidic and expose it to hydrogen and uh, thus we can it can result in having a chain failure at below capacity. So avoid acidic substances when we clean the chain. Some other things is uh, tumbling the chain. Uh, you can have a tumbler similar to a cement mixer. It's not really a cement, but a, a tumbler where you throw in leather straps. Uh, newspaper works good to take off paint. Walnut shells. Um, and you tumble the chain and that'll clean it thoroughly. Um, is pretty much what we do in um, that we do in our repair stations where we repair um, alloy chains. But a lot of hoisting companies will use a tumbler to clean up the chains, and it really it's really amazing when you see it how well how clean it comes out. And just general lubricating the chain will clean that chain up. The lubrication itself will um, clean the chain up quite a bit too. So you got to have this clean schedule. You want to get rid of um, any metal shavings, filings, dirt, things of that nature. All that is going to cause damage to your hoist and, and, and the chain to wear. So what are some good lubrication methods? So that's another question that we get at them. How do we lubricate our chain? Well, the best way is to remove the, the chain from the hoist, immerse the chain in lubricating oil, because what that's going to do is going to cause the chain to go slack. And really, where we want that oil is the inner links, where the or link to link contact as it's articulating. Um, what's you know, if you just sprayed the chain down with something with a spray, you're probably not really getting it into those inner links um, unless you slacked it and sprayed it manually, sprayed it between those inner links. So by doing that, uh, uh, you know, and then you, you got to what you got to do. It's I mean, it's going to be a little bit messy, but you keep the bucket nearby, rehang the chain, and wipe all the excess off, and then let it kind of drip the excess drip into the bucket. Um, it doesn't take that long. It seems like wow, that seems like a hassle, but you know, I know just being out in the field and doing it for people out in the field, it's really not all that bad to do once you get the hang of it. It's not all that messy either. And you'll have that, that chain will be thoroughly oiled and, and will um, be oiled correctly. And thus we'll see really a minimize of wear with that chain. Um, really when, we, when we're lubricating, when, we, when hoists are properly lubricated, we see very little instances of wear problems with hoists if you maintain a proper cleaning and lubrication schedule. Uh, the second way to do it is use an oil-soaked sponge and run the hoist, pulling the chain through the sponge and squeezing the oil into the inner links of the chain. Um, that's, that's another way to do it if you don't want to take your chain out. Uh, another way is to lay it on a table or a bench and kind of drizzle the oil on there. Um, and again, it's a little bit messy way to do that, but we're just kind of giving you ways to do that. Again, getting into those inner links. Um, again, stacking the chain using a small oil can with a dropper at the end, oil the inner links again, and then wiping the chain with the excess off. Okay, but the main gist we're trying to get here is getting into those inner links. So whatever works best for you to oil that, um, just spraying it the outer links. That's going to present prevent oxidation of the outer links, but it's really not going to get into those inner links. So we we really got to get into those inner links. Um, really quick, Peter, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a polling question, okay? So here it is. Let me launch it. If any of you are on the iPad, uh, you can just put your answer in the Q&A pane or just not worry about it because it doesn't work. But for the rest of you, if you can please vote. Zinc plating on chain acts like a lubricant, so no further lubricant is required. Is that true or false? Let us know what you think. Well, it'll I'll give it another couple seconds. Peter, it looks like it's a unanimous decision that that's a false statement. Yeah, and, that's good. and there's been some kind of um, misrepresentation or, or, or in the industry that we've, we're hearing once in a while that when someone sees zinc plated chain, they think that's like a self-lubrication or, or the zinc plating provides some form of lubrication that you won't have to uh, lubricate your chain, and so we just want to dispel that rumor, and that's the reason uh, we want to ask that that question to see what people thought. But I'm I'm glad everyone on here knows better not to uh, have it see zinc plating and then think they don't need to lubricate because if that's the case, you're going to run into a lot of issues. So zinc plating is not a substitute for lubrication. Great, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. So what is where? You know, I've been saying, mentioning wear a bunch of times, and you kind of compare wear to a fire. To have a fire, you need oxygen, you need fuel, you need heat, and that causes a fire, and you remove one of those, and you put out the fire. So if you look at a wear triangle, 
what causes wear. Three leaves causes wear. Two surfaces touching, you know, no, no lubrication, two surfaces rubbing together. They're under some type of load and they need to move. Okay, so all three of those combined, you're going to start to have wear. So you have to remove one of those to prevent wear. Well, we're hoisting something up, so we cannot prevent movement. The hoist job is to lift the load, so we cannot remove the load. That's not an issue. That's not possible. So the only thing we can do is prevent those surfaces from touching. And doing the EP oil, the bar and chain oil that we provide, um, will prevent those surfaces from touching. Thus, if the surfaces aren't touching, then you're actually riding over on an, on an oil, a small amount of oil, which is preventing those surfaces from touching. We prevent wear. Okay, and so that that removes the wear. So you're putting out the fire, or you're you're putting out the wear. You're you're removing it from happening by maintaining a good lubricating hoist. So when you're looking, when you're doing an inspection, you want to look. You want to slack the chain. You want to do a link by link inspection. So that you're going to see more. The operators aren't going to do this. The operator should just be making maintenance well aware of when they feel oil needs to be done, and so that you need to train your operators to look for dry chain and get the uh, maintenance there to do lubrication. But when you're doing your inspections, uh, we talked about that case step. So you want to treat each mark individually depending on where the uh, wear is occurring. So if it's on the outer link, um, because of that case step, we can wear on the outer link about 10 thousandths of an inch. But if it's on the inner link, we really limit it to 5 thousandths of an inch. Even though we said the case step is thicker than that, um, Really, but once you start to see wear in those areas, it creates a, a rough surface. And at that point, no amount of lubrication is going to uh, help. It's just going to start wearing faster at that point because of that rough surface. And, and so we tend to like to take it out of service um, a little bit sooner than the outer link, so, so five thousandths of an inch. So you got to slack in the chain to do that. And, it's, and we do train people how to inspect chain in our classes, and we go through all through that. So I'm going to mention, but we're, we're going to stick with wear for this um, presentation. So treating the links individually, so let's look at this. You know, a lot of pictures that we show, um, we show some extremes and so they're, you know, we like to kind of best represent, well, what about slight wear and things of that nature? What's good? What's bad? So here's a cross-sectional view of, of the chain and again, put, you can see the black would be with the case step. And we have two individual. We have a, on the on the upper left corner there. You see, there's nine nine thousandths of wear um, on each side. You can still pass that, right? We're still at the K step, and it's it's not a really that's not a high wear area. But there's you got to want to figure out where why is that wear occurring there? Is it is it from operator use, from side loading? Is it um, is, is there some reason why the chain's jumping around? So you want to figure out why that wear is occurring, or it could be rubbing up against something on on the load itself. Um, or if you're seeing it repeated periodically throughout the chain, then it's possible that there's something wrong with the lift wheel. The one just below that, again, it's just on one side, that would pass. And then you can see um, in the inner link, on the bottom there, that would be where the inner link is, only five, five thousandths of wear there. And then again, on one side, we see ten thousandths of wear. That's where we would re reject it uh, on the one on the lower uh, right-hand corner there. Definitely reject at that scenario. So here's an actual picture um, that you look at and it doesn't, you know, that picture to look at that doesn't look all that bad, but that's the type of issue that we see where you're going to see accelerated where we would want you to reject that. Um, again, you can put as much lubrication on that as you want. It's already a rough surface uh, and the lubrication isn't going to do much to stop it from uh, accelerating. And I'm going to show you some, even what happens as, as this accelerates, some actual pictures. Uh, the next step to check for, we're not, you know, beyond the link by link in is to measure the chain out. Now, so you could have slight wear going on throughout many links and visually looking, you might not be able to catch it. So you're going to go um, and take, take a good measurement of good chain that's not used possibly in the bucket that doesn't pass over the hoist and select an unworn and unstretched length chain it would be approximately, use an odd number of links, approximately 12 to 24 inches in length. Take the measurement of that, write it down, and then measure the same number of links in a used section of chain, okay? And if the length differs by one and a half percent, then you're going to reject that chain, and that's basically telling you the chain is worn out. We, we 
or or it could be stretched from overload, but most likely it's happening from wear. Um, now that is the universal uh, method, you know, that's in the ASME B 3016. So, but we do recommend that you get the maintenance manual for that hoist and read for each individual hoist what the wear criteria is. This is in the event that, hey, you don't have the maintenance manual. We understand that you're in the field, you're doing inspections, so you need, you need something to go by. So in the event you don't have something to go by, you fall back in the ASME B3016, which is kind of a universal wear allowance. But I would definitely recommend getting uh, each hoist maintenance manual and see what they, the manufacturer spells out. Okay, I have another uh, polling question for you. If you could please vote. The question is, what is the most critical part of the chain to expect for wear? Is it outer curved surfaces, outer and inside of straight edges, inner link radius, or outer flat face of chain? If everyone could please vote, we would appreciate it. My gosh, this is a very interesting group, Peter. <laughs> very interesting. Okay, we have, it looks like, we'll give it another couple, couple more people. All right, right now it looks like 93% say inner link radius, 4% say outer and inside of straight sides, and another 4%, 3%, outer curved surfaces. So Peter, go ahead and share with us the answer. Yeah, it's the inner link. The inner link radius, that's the, where the chain is, is attached to each other. Um, you definitely got to get in, in between those inner links. That's where it's really critical to have the lubrication and, and again a lot of people don't do that because they just wipe the chain quickly with you know they they get all the outer surfaces which prevents oxidation and rusting which is which is great but the real issue is the inner links where it's articulating and, and riding in that lip wheel and so you want to you want to make sure you get in those inner links great thank you peter okay so let's look at, these are actual case studies of, of chain, and what I, off to the left there, you see a picture of a lift wheel and how the chain goes over the lift wheel. So you can see there's a, where the link is flat, and then you have the upstanding link, the upstanding link where it shows the weld away from the lift wheel for proper reading. Most links are that way. Um, and then you can see here some extremely worn chain. And you can, that's what happens when you get through that case step. It gets to be like a hot knife through butter and it, it goes really fast. So you can see how thin that chain is getting from lack of lubrication on there. And then toward the bottom, the upstanding link, because it's no longer fitting in the lift, it's jumping around now because of that wear. It's, it, again, we have dimensional stability, so with that pocket lift wheel, just fits the chain perfectly so it pulls and it, and it rides smoothly. So that's gonna, most likely the operator would see erratic or hearing that cr cracking noise and things of that nature. Uh, of the chain jumping around. You can even see the upstanding or the uh, link uh, up right below it, how even on one side it's almost like, like it was grinded off. So extremely damaged. In this case, that lift wheel would have to be replaced as well. So if you're seeing chain with this amount of damage, you're going to have to get that hoist down and tear into the hoist and replace the lift wheel. So if you just, at this point, if you just replaced the chain, so you saw the chain, like, wow, we got to put a new chain in there. Um, it, it does happen at times you're going to find that the new chain is going to wear out quickly because it's going to be sliding around that lift wheel and jumping around because the lift wheel is damaged at that point. Those are some great images, Peter. Yeah, that's some, some extreme... Extreme cases, but they really de demonstrate your point. It, it happens more than you think, and it, it's definitely um, something to look out for. Here you can see uh, various parts of the hoist frame were damaged because the chain wore. It rode higher in the lift wheel, creating pressure against the guides. Also, um, not feeding in properly, so you can see it's, it, it, the chain was banging up the guides. And then actually, because it was jumping so hard and within that hoist, you can, there was actually a crack in the frame where, that, where the pin suspension for the um, chain guys there. So there's on the lower picture that the frame is actually cracked from the force of that chain jumping around. So now in that case, I mean, that, that's a, a severely damaged choice. Not only is the lift wheel damaged, uh, the chain guides are damaged, and the case is now damaged from the chain. So it's a, it's a very costly repair from just lack of lubrication. Here, um, the chain was lubricated. However, there was a lot of metal filings and things that was dirty. Um, there was no real cleaning schedule, so on the lift wheel itself, there was a lot of metal filings, and those metal filings, the chain was riding in, causing wear, 
Um, and so again, a, a regular cleaning. That, so this this base this case study is showing that how important it is to clean that chain and wipe it. And so if you have that hoist is operating in, a, in an environment where there is a lot of contamination from whether either metal filings or whatever the operation may be, that that chain needs to be cleaned every once in a while. And by not doing that, um, it's going to accelerate the wear on that chain. And so here, you, again, you can see the damage caused on the guides itself and the chain jumping around in there. And that's it. So you can see how badly damaged the guides are, and that's why you see the outer wear happening on the chain. Uh, again, lubrication isn't going to stop that at that point. It's, it's beyond repair, and so uh, a lot of hoist damage going on. Again, more case studies shown through the case depth, the flat links, accelerator wear. And this, again, once you get through that case, it happens quickly. And so these are uh, images of chain that, had, that we, we received for testing. And you can see that chain is almost, you know, is ready to break. And then some damaged lift, a little better uh, examples of damaged lift wheels from severely worn chain and how damaged those lift wheels uh, can become. And again, it's a, it's a big job. It's got to come down the whole entire hoist, has to be disassembled and a new lift wheel put in, and possibly even damage to the um, structure of the hoist could happen. All from a simple, simply by not lubricating the chain. So mm -hmm. uh, such, a, such a simple uh, thing to do uh, and by not doing it such costly repairs. You know, similar if you drove your car without changing the oil and, you know, eventually you're going to ha have a very costly repair by not doing that. Um, so think of that by just keep keep lubricating your chain and, and things of that nature. You're, you're going you're gonna to see very little wear and very little problems um, with that hoist. So in summary, lubrication is very important. It cannot be neglected. Keep an eye out for dry chain. You know, a small amount of lubricant will greatly increase the life of chain. It doesn't take much to get into those inner links. Uh, don't allow it to run dry. You know, clean and have regular intervals. Again, each operation is different, so you're going to have to kind of take it on a your, how often you need to do it. Need to do it. So normal weekly cleanings of lubrication is recommended. Uh, under hot, dirty conditions, it may be necessary to clean the chain at least once a day and lubricate it several times between cleanings. It depends on a severe environment. I mean, that would be a very severe environment. Um, and again, for those that say they just can't lubricate for whatever that case may be, anything is better than nothing. Okay, so any type of lubrication is better than nothing. Um, just be advised that if you're running without lubrication, that's that's called a severe environment. It's not normal to not be able to operate your hoist without lubrication to chain. So if that's the, the situation you're in, your inspection procedures need to step up. So you cannot wait for that periodic inspection, you're going to have to do it um, monthly or even even more than monthly inspections of that chain if you're running it dry. You're gonna you're gonna and you're gonna run through you're gonna be replacing a lot of chain often if that's the case. Uh, but then if that's the nature of the operation, it's just uh, something you're gonna need to do. Okay. Good time. We just got a couple questions in. Okay. So the first question is this comes all the way from South Africa. When a powered hoist is operating in a dusty and windy environment, what lubricant do you recommend to use to avoid making a grinding paste situation? Right, and that's, and that's one of those situations why someone wouldn't lubricate the chain. So in this case, um, you know, we don't have any good studies on any other type of like a dry graphite or anything like that. But that's what I, you know, a lot of people use like a dry graphite or something of that nature in the field to, uh, to do that, to prevent it. And um, it's something that you're going to have to keep an eye on. So whatever lubrication you decide, what kind of dry type graphite lubrication that you decide to use, um, your inspections are going to tell you a lot. So you're going to have to, um, I would definitely keep an eye on that chain in those environments and, and uh, keep a, a nice log and how often the hoist is being used and, and try to get a good history of what lubrication is working, working best and, and keeping that chain in good condition. Again, it, it's one of those things, something is better than nothing. But we, we really, to be honest with you, we really don't have very good data on um, those types of environments. It's just hard to duplicate that severe type of environment and how, how the chain would, would last in that. So um, you're just going to have to step up your inspection procedures and use what works best in those situations. Okay, thanks, Peter. Next question, how often does chain need to be pull tested? 
Um, we that's a good question. Um, the answer the answer to that question is if there's nothing wrong with the chain, uh, no, never. We we test the we test the chain at the factory for you, and that's the, the, the test that you get. And so at that point, if there's nothing ever wrong with the chain, um, you should never have to retest the chain. Now, when you replace load suspension parts within a hoist, it's recommended that you do a load test if you're doing if you're repairing it. The hoist chain is not repairable, so you cannot repair a hoist chain. So therefore, you know anybody that's doing repairs, so that a load test would not certify it. You should remove the chain and put new chain in, so you can't repair it. Uh, but theoretically, chain is excluded from um, having to do a chain and wire rope are excluded from having to do a load test. So if you're replacing wire rope and chain within a hoist, it's actually excluded from the requirements of doing a load test because the manufacturers are testing it already as received. So really, you're you're just I mean, if you're doing a test and you want to do that once you install it, I certainly wouldn't stop you from doing that. That's great, but all you're doing is verifying what the manufacturer already verified for you. Um, if you're putting a hoist in place, uh, it's a new installation. Um, I would definitely test it in place because you're testing the structure and the uh, setup that you did for that hoist. So highly recommended um, you test the hoist there. But again, if the hoist is running fine, you're not replacing any load-bearing components, and there absolutely is no reason to do a load test. So theoretically, a hoist can run indefinitely in service without having to do another load test. And the load test, I mean, it's about 100 at work enrollment or 125 percent above the work enrollment what the test would be. Um, you still would do operational tests, which is light loads to check it. You know, your operator should be doing that pre-shift inspections. That's different than a load test. But the answer is never. Once we test it, that chain's good to go. Um, if you're doing it, I, you know that's great. You know that if you're doing that on a on a regular basis, I wouldn't stop you from doing it, but it's not required. Okay, bunch more questions then. We're going to take questions just for a few more minutes, and then whatever questions don't get answered on the call, Peter will personally send you an email and respond, okay? So the next question is, how effective would natural lubricants like coconut oil or olive oil be in food-safe areas? Again, we don't have, I wouldn't have good, that's, you know, we would have to uh, test those in those environments. Again, it goes, I go all back to something's better than nothing. Yes. Um, again, if that's what you're using, that is a you know you can classify that as as a abnormal operating condition, um, so that your inspection procedures would have to step up on that hoisting equipment. So you could not you would have to do your you would have to look at that on a monthly basis and do your inspections of that chain and get a good record of how good that lubricant is lasting and when you're starting to see wear, and then you'll have a good idea from that point once you have a history of how often you're going to need to replace that chain or maybe try a different lubricant. But we do not have good testing on those types of oils, so I couldn't give you a definitive answer. But again, I'd rather see you do that than use nothing. Okay. All right. Does welding spatter warrant replacement of a chain? Immediately, yes. Yeah. Take out of service immediately. Okay. Perfect. And let's see. Okay. If using plated chain, does the wear measurement am amount change to include the plating? So if using plated no. chain, does the wear measurement amount change to include the plating? No, plating is so thin, it's not, it, it, really we don't include that, so we, it's, it's more of the case, it's the case step that we're worried about, that hardness of the chain, so no, it, we don't include that. Okay, and we'll take one more question. For wear replacement criteria, is the following rule still acceptable? 5% of any chain link dimension. Oh, for wear allowance. Um, I believe that's, a, you know, that's a, a generalization of the, I'd have to pull um, the ASME spec to look at that. Um, drawing a blank right now, whether it's yeah, I think on electric hoist they do call it five percent, but I'll, I'll I'll definitely answer that in an email and send that out to everybody. I'll get a definitive one hundred percent on that. Uh, but you definitely want to look at the uh, what would the manufacturer say. We're more worried about that K step, so I don't want to say five percent. It depends where your wear is occurring on the inner links, five thousandths of an inch, like we said in the in the in the uh, in the beginning of this presentation. So that's again why we're doing this as well because. Um, that 5% may be way too much. Okay. 
All right, I'll tell you what, there are two more questions, but I'm going to let Peter continue with the final slides, and then um, I'll ask them if you want to hear the answers. They're good ones. So, yeah, Peter, go ahead. Okay. Um, just a few things. Our next webinar is uh, February 18th. It's going to be uh, presented by Chris Segoda, who was very, very knowledgeable in variable frequency drives, and he's going to cover how they work, basic programming features, troubleshooting features, and overview the type of frequency drives in their application. So, um, really good thing to have in your hoist for load control and uh, for operations of your hoist. It gives your hoist a brain, if you will, and it, um, if you operate a hoist without one or with one, it's like night and day. Um, some other training classes that are coming up. Uh, we have rigor workshops, March 17th to the 19th, overhead crane and hoist inspection, where we cover the overall inspection of the systems, um, of the crane system is uh, January 20th from top to bottom, January 20th to 22nd, and January 27th to 29th are the most recent ones coming up. Um, the wire rope chain and hoist wire rope repair school, where we actually break down hoists, tear them down. We go over bolt nuts, washers, settings internally in the hoist. Uh, that's March 2nd through the 6th. Um, and that includes the wire rope and chain hoist. Just chain hoist repair certification. We have one coming up in January. 20th to 22nd, February 3rd to the 5th, and February 10th to the 12th. And you can go on to our website, cmcodepot.com, and to learn those are some really great training programs. And um, people that come are just, when they leave, they're always um, exceeded their expectations. And usually we get this is the best training we ever had. We just love the hands-on and how much equipment we went over. So really good schools, and even in the rigging, all hands-on. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask the final two questions. We have Peter Hogan, which is one of our quality managers at our uh, one operation where we manufacture the chain. If anybody has any specific questions you'd like to ask him, that would be another option. I have a couple more, so and this might be one for him. Uh, the question is, what viscosity in centistokes is let's see, used to have the bar and chain in oil? It's, this comes from a gentleman out of Guatemala, so I'm trying to figure out what he's uh, asking here. Peter, maybe you can better... What viscosity in centistokes is used? I'll tell you what. We will... Uh, in a second. We will, we will come in contact with you, the gentleman, Luis, and uh, we will clarif better clarify your question. There's one more. Uh, let's see. I have a sand chain gauge used for... Uh, model F and L chain. Are these still available from CM, and is there one for the ProStar chain? Yeah, the ProStar is the shop star, so um, I believe that's on the chain gauge out, out there. I'll verify that. I have yes, we do. We still sell that chain gauge. Uh, please, I believe I sent you a graphic on that a while back as well. Um, but I can get that inform. We can get that information out to people. But yes, we do sell it, and I'll verify that. Um, the Pro Star being a, that's an, a black version of the Shop Star. It's for the entertainment hoist. You know, we we paint it black for camouflaging and entertainment venues. But that would have the same criteria as the Shop Star hoist, which is the industrial version painted orange. Okay, perfect. And a couple of people. I'll look to see if it's on the gauge, and I'll, I'll, I'll we can send everybody an email. Out and I just off the top of my head, I can't remember if the Shop Star is on there or not. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to send everybody a follow-up email with a link to the recording. A few of you have asked if you can have access to this recording, and yes, we are recording it. We're going to be posting it on our YouTube channel, and we'll send everyone a link. And in that follow-up email, we'll include the information Peter just referenced. So we like to wrap up things uh, on time, and like I said, those questions that we haven't answered, Peter will send you a follow-up email addressing. But I just want to let everyone know we are on social media. We have a blog. We have a YouTube channel. We are on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus as well as Instagram. So you can go to our website, cmworks.com, which is on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen, and you can see all of the places where you can connect with us there. We love to answer your questions. We love to share news about what we're doing and our products and issues that you might have in what you're doing. So we'd love to connect with you there and just wanted to raise awareness. Thank you to everyone for attending.